scripture reading comes from selected readings from Acts 10, the story of Cornelius. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He answered, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon, who is called Peter. While Cornelius' messengers were going to Joppa, Peter had a vision in which a voice said three times, What God has me made clean, you must not call for them. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Look, Three men are searching for you. Now get up, go down, and go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. As he, and he said to them, You yourselves know that it is unlawful for you to associate or visit with the Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He was Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for power for God as with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as a judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness and sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. Most of you have heard me say it many times, so if you want to join me in the prayer, please feel free. Lord, may the words of my mouth this morning and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day and all days. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I want to start by talking about some personal observations. As an intentional interim, I have tended to go in and out of churches on average until recently about every two years. So I have been in the position to see changes that impact not just the congregation I'm working with right at that time, but changes that impact the broader church, multiple congregations, most if not all of us at times. And I want to talk about one change in particular because it has and continues to impact how we share faith with our children, how we nurture our own faith, and how we encourage the faith of those we're trying to reach out to. As a young pastor, I would comb through my denomination's opportunity list basically looking to see what skills and qualifications people were looking for. And I rapidly noticed a pattern. At that time, churches were growing and many churches were looking for a second staff person because a sole pastor couldn't cope with all of the activities and programs and classes. And in most cases, when they were looking for a second person, the request was for a Christian educator or a back person with a background in Christian education. Over the years, I noticed that began to decline. 
And instead, I started seeing churches asking for someone with a background in spiritual direction. And then I realized it wasn't just the Christian church. The interest in spiritual direction was growing cross-denominationally, beyond Christianity, even in non-religious groups. And if you read your recall ballot carefully, you may have noticed the woman who called herself the Joyful Warrior. And if you looked her up, she says she is a shaman who runs retreats and workshops for people to grow spiritually. But she has nothing we would consider a typical religious background. After a while, this is still going on by the way, we don't talk so much about spiritual direction at this point as people will say that they want a pastor who can help the congregation grow spiritually and deepen their faith. I began to wonder about what caused the change. And it finally dawned on me I had seen the change develop as a child. The problem is the baby boom. Ken Callahan, who I consider a mentor, would say in his conferences, and said it to us many times, that following World War II, the church rebuilt society by offering programs for all kinds of all ages, shapes, interests of people. What many people don't realize is that at that same time, you had the baby boom and that youth programs were literally flooded, swamped by the number of kids who were interested. Or to put it another way, there weren't enough meters to deal with all of the kids looking for programs. Those of you who were close to me in age probably remember the years of the large youth group programs. Those of you who our retired teachers probably understand very well the difference in the kind of interactions you can have when you are leading a group of 15 that suddenly becomes a group of 30 or 60 or more. So something got lost. The way programs were run, the way church programs were run, had to change. I have listened to people somewhat older than me who tell about the wonderful youth programs they had, where an advisor worked with them and taught them things like how to organize an event, how to run a meeting, how to design a worship service and present it to the congregation, how to get up in front and lead people in prayer. And as they'd say, when they think back, they realize that's where they learned the skills that made them church leaders and not just people who attended. I envy them those programs because they weren't there in my childhood. Instead, we moved to having, instead of advisors, youth leaders, and they planned the whole program. They decided what the discussion would be on any particular day, what events would be happening, when they do a fellowship, when they might do something of a service. What got lost in the whole process was relationships. Now, how do you have relationships, deep, sheltering relationships that help people grow when you're trying to keep track of a large group of people? The congregation I grew up in for years did a program called the Summer Club and ended it every year taking the kids involved from San Diego up to Disneyland in Anaheim. They rented buses, not school buses. That's a long enough trip they rented, rented the big air-conditioned buses that had the bathroom in the back so they didn't have to stop and come along the way. <laughs> And they always rented at least three of those big buses. Imagine trying to sh 
peppered and heard and coached that many kids. The result was that in church after church, the change in program went from adult advisors who coached the kids and taught the kids skills and so forth to what I call the charismatic youth leader who set up the whole program. People still learned, but somehow without the relationships, what they didn't learn and they didn't gain was a real understanding from people who had long walk of faith of how faith would shape and could shape their lives. Those discussions started to get lost. And over the last 40 years, the result has been people have left the church in droves. The Christian church in the U.S. and other parts of the world also, which experience the same thing, has been in steady decline. This last year, for the first time, the Pew organization that studies churches says that the majority of people are no longer Christians in this country. What caused it? As I said, too many kids to be able to do the kinds of nurture the church had traditionally done. And then we kept on doing the same kind of programs. Christian education went down. Spiritual growth became important. That is a cry from people. It's a cry on the part of the church, and you hear it outside the church when people say, I'm spiritual but not religious. Religious is all that structured stuff. Religious is too much doctrine and dogma, and it doesn't show me how faith is means to me in my life. That cry, that cry for something more is still very present in our world. The people around us, the people in many churches are still saying, teach me, show me how faith touches my life. And for some time now, I have been saying to people, the change is that it used to be people came to church to learn about God, but that's not what happens anymore. Now people come wanting to meet God to encounter God, to know where God is in their own life. Which brings me to the story of Cornelius. And you may want to read chapter 10 at some point because we edited out a lot of the story, or it would have been very long. Cornelius was a Gentile, someone that a good Jew would not go around at all. But he also was a man seeking faith. He was a good man. And so God reaches out to him one day and an angel says, go find this guy named Peter. He's over in this other town. And well, Cornelius' people are going to find Peter. Peter is having this vision in which God puts down all the animals in a sheet and says, eat. Cornelius and Peter I'm a good Jew, I'm not going to eat. And the comment is, whatever I've made clean, don't make unclean. Peter is still puzzling over the meaning of this when somebody comes to his door and they want to take him to meet a, good, meet a Gentile. And he goes. And he says to them, look, I'm a good Jew, you know. It's wrong for me to be with you. But God told me I need to be here, so I'm here. And we see in what Peter does in interacting with Cornelius and Cornelius' these people a model of what it is to truly share faith. Because he tells the story but he is also told what has happened to himself. 
He's told how God has come to him and told him to change the way he thinks and to go to be with Cornelius. He talks with Cornelius. He talks with the people. And then when the Holy Spirit falls on these Gentiles, he realizes things aren't exactly the way he thought. God's for them also. Sometimes we forget that. God's for the people outside the church also. And what we're called to do is to help people experience the fullness of God. That faith that not only touches part of us, but all of us, our minds, our hearts, our spirits. Because it is then that God changes us. And maybe that's the wrong description. That is when God allows us and enables us to be all that we were created to be. But we've got an awful lot of people now who've never been in church. One of the results of all the youth programs that were wonderful programs, but where the interconnection and the relationships got lost, is somehow churches forgot that ministry is about relationships. And I can actually remember going to a conference, and as we were walking out of one lecture, I said to the woman walking next to me, who I didn't know, why is it whenever we talk about ministry, we talk about programs? She said, what else would it be? We need to start building the relationships because that's when faith is truly deepened and shared. And that's what Cornelius asked for and that's what Peter did, was to build a relationship that brought people to faith. Now I'm going to admit that if I were sitting where you are listening to someone talking like I am, I'd probably want to know about more about what is this spiritual growth stuff. And when it first started appearing, I can remember parishioners saying, well, what is all this spiritual growth stuff about? Why isn't it just enough to read the Bible and follow it? I can't talk about it today, but next sermon. We'll talk about what is the orientation, the purpose, the goal for Christians to grow spiritually. And then in the weeks to come, we'll just basically scratch at the surface of, surface of some of the things the church has done throughout history that people have found useful to do the kind of growth that people are crying out for now. We need to go back and understand that we have to reclaim the relationships both with God and with each other and with other people. Because it is in the relationships that faith deepens and is shared. 